welcome everybody. Say thanks for coming out again. Uh, appreciate you being here. I know it's not easy to get across Austin on a Friday afternoon at rush hour. Um, so we're going to start a couple minutes early to make sure we stay on track and give you as much information, or I should say let the doctors give you as much information as they possibly can. I'm going to introduce a couple of people, and after the presentation, there will be a short question and answer session for anybody that has any questions. Uh, I want to start by introducing Hill, um, owner of Bicycle Sports Shop, a passionate cycling advocate and cyclist for at least since you've owned the shop for 30 years now, right? Um, Hill not only loves cycling, but he also appreciates the fact that gear set up appropriately enhances that riding experience and makes it that much more enjoyable, that much more pleasurable, that much more fun. Um, so I want to let Hill have a few words, and uh, then I'll introduce the doctors. I just want to thank everybody for coming out tonight and joining us. Um, when we heard about the opportunity to have the doctors Mincow and Pruitt join us tonight, I was absolutely thrilled. And uh, as any of my longtime staff members will tell you, I bleed specialized red blood. Uh, I have been a, uh, a passionate advocate for specialized product. I feel like they are one of the most cutting edge companies in the bicycle industry today. And I've had the pleasure of knowing uh, the Mike Senior, the owner, owner of Specialized for about 25 years, and watching this company it has, as it has evolved and grown. And his passion has always been about how do you make a bicycle more comfortable and a better tool for us to go out and enjoy our bike rides. And really, that's what it comes down to. You know, they love to win races. They love to sponsor pro teams out there in Europe and all over the world. But Mike Senior is a rider. Um, I've been on, on bike rides with this man who is now, I think, 65, 67 years old. And he'll go out and he'll knock out a century every Saturday and Sunday, almost every weekend that he's home because he loves to be on his bicycle riding hard. And the outgrowth of that is products like all the body geometry equipment, because he's been the guy that's been out there with his feet hurting and his butt hurting and his hands hurting and going, this is miserable and I want to make it better. So his mission has been to go find people like these guys and develop products that help us have more fun on our bicycles. Because truly, when it comes down to it, that's what it's all about, is going out on our bikes and having fun. I hope that everybody here takes at least a couple of nuggets away from uh, the presentation that we're going to see tonight. Uh, it's going to be extremely dynamic. I've seen some of the, the presentations that these guys have done, and they are uh, a lot of fun. They'll answer questions for you at the end of it, and um, they're a wealth of knowledge, for, so please feel free to tap into that knowledge. And again, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. So you'll forgive me. I have a couple of notes here. I don't want to miss anything. Uh, thank you very much, Hill. Uh, Dr. Minkow, who's joining us this evening, is a physician and a cycling product designer. And he is the person behind the first body geometry saddle, literally going into his garage with a scalpel and going to work on some saddles that he had sitting around back in 1997. Of course, that saddle design and saddle line became the body geometry saddle. And now it's a full range of saddles designed for different riders and different styles of riding. And most notably, the designer of the Roman, and it's actually named after Dr. Minghao. Dr. Pruitt is the founder of the Boulder Center for Sports Medicine and is a recognized expert in cycling biomechanics and bicycle fitting. And really is the person who pioneered bicycle fitting in three dimensions, looking at not just the X, Y plane, but also the Z plane. And he's responsible not only for the success of specialized shoe line and shoe design, um, but also specialized fit school, uh, SBCU. And he's served as a consultant to a number of pro tour teams and pro tour riders. We're really honored and very excited to have these gentlemen here to talk with us about uh, bicycle biomechanics, fitting, and all things there related. Gentlemen, Perfect. thank you. Thank you. Andy and I have been uh, traveling around the world now for almost 15 years uh, with body geometry products, and we've had a great, 
great time and a great deal of fun. We want to thank you for coming out tonight. It's uh, kind of unusual for us to see an audience that speaks English and uh, t for us to be able to read our own slides because- We're, we're in Texas, Roger. Are we're you sure they're speaking yeah. English? Yeah. We just- Y'all? <laughs> we just came from um, uh, two weeks in, in Asia and we were in North Korea, uh, in North Korea, we were in South Korea. <laughs> we, we were close. We actually were pretty we were close. close. We'll tell, uh, th we're gonna tell some stories tonight, but uh, <laughs> in South Korea and Seoul, uh, I had said to our guy, I said, uh, is there any way we can see the DMZ? And the guy said, first of all, they said all the other bike companies that were supposed to be in, in Seoul when we were there said, we we're not coming because it's too dangerous. And we said, we want to go see the DMZ. <laughs> so um, one of the guys in, in Seoul was friends with a high school buddy that was a, a general in the South Korean army. And he hooked us up with his attache and they drove us to the inside the DMZ to a mountaintop outlook where we could see the turrets and the North Korean outposts. So we were one half mile from the, from the uh, border and uh, no tourist had ever been there before and Andy's wife was the first woman tourist that had ever been there right. as well. So um, anyway, that was part of our experience. So um, cycling, we, we travel around the world and we see that cycling is so important everywhere in the world and people have uh, some common needs and some special needs depending on where they are. Um, this is your picture, Andy. You got to say something on this. Uh, we were actually on a bike ride in Shanghai and I came across the recycling man. If you look really hard at that tricycle, it's got a flatbed on the back of it. And it's full of lumber and aluminum and a fan he had found. That's not jet propulsion, that's a recycling uh, electrical appliance. Um, and I asked him if I could ride his bike for this picture. Trust me, the saddle was not body geometry. Um, I, I'm sure the man has no children. Um, Actually, he probably has 10 or 12. Yeah, th there was no bearings in the head tube. So the head, the steer tube rattled in the hair tube. No be bearings on the bottom or the, or the top. No padding on his seat. And he rode it eight hours a day at a very slow cadence. OSHA would love to have had this guy uh, e examined. But anyway, the, the bottom line is, is that it's pretty evident to Roger and I that cycling is, is, is changing around the world and we're trying to, I jokingly said last night, we're trying to change the, change the world by, through cycling, one knee and one penis at a time. So, um, and we're striving, striving to do so. So anyway. Yeah, you left out the women, but that's okay. Did I? Yeah. I've never left out the women. So body geometry is, it's, it's a system of how we design it and make products. And it's been like that for the last 15 years. So ergonomically designed, scientifically tested, what we do is we look for problems and we look for physiological problems and then we, tr we design a solution. And you'll see uh, in the saddle talk that I'm gonna give now how we evolve from prototypes to finished products. But we start with the problem and we design what we think is gonna work and then we design a testing method to test it. And uh, we'll talk a bit about testing because it's so important, especially on the saddles. The um, pressure testing and the blood flow testing has been the main part of our d development of saddles for the last 15 years. So it starts with the anatomy and all of our problems and all, all of our solutions are always centered around the anatomy. If we look at the pelvic uh, bones here and we look at the internal pudental arteries on the left and the right side, uh, you can see a little bit here, there's a yellow pudental nerve that runs next to the artery. There's a canal called Alcox Canal, and it's a band of tissue that covers the artery and the nerve right here. And this is where, when you sit straight up on a bike, this is where the, the blood flow is impinged. So arteriographic evidence, even in 1997, showed that that was the area of problems. We also know that under the symphysis here, the blue object here, if a rider rides in an arrow position, they're going to pinch the nerve or compress the artery in that area. So in designing the body geometry saddles, it's always been very important to look at these two areas and see uh, what we needed to do to relieve the blood flow and relieve the pressure on the nerves. If we look at the front of the saddle, you can see the V shape of the arteries and nerves. And uh, the V shape becomes very important. And even in the first um, body geometry saddle in 1997, 
When I designed the cutout, it was actually a short cutout, and we only did it for six months and then ex extended it. But uh, all I did was mimic the shape of the, the pelvic bones at that time in 1997 to try and relieve the pressure in the center, uh, realizing that the body is 65% water, so we're basically like a water balloon. If we can take the pressure out from the center, then the blood can flow more freely and the nerve won't be compressed. It's extremely important for us to understand pelvic position when we design saddles. So in an upright uh, riding situation, the rider is riding, here's the sit bones here, but really we're not riding on two points of bones. We're riding on the bottom of the pelvic uh, bones, which is more like the legs of a rocking chair. And so in an upright position, you're gonna have more pressure in the back area here. And uh, this is the Roman, and you see that the rider is more in the middle part of the, of the pubic rami, and then finally in the sitero, we see that we're riding on the front of the pelvic bones. And so in designing the saddles, we have to understand who the rider is, what, they, what they're doing, where the anatomy is, in order to design the correct product for them. This was the proto, one of the prototypes. This was the first prototype of the Roman. And I, I made this in my uh, garage. It's beautiful, I think. <laughs> and uh, I took it to Specialized, and we had a rider uh, at Specialized, Andy Jockmain, and he was a professional uh, racer, but he was also one of our product managers. And I say, Andy, um, working on an idea for a saddle with a lower, lower nose, some kind of a, some kind of a, a drop on the nose, and I want to kick up in the back. And I made this fantastic prototype. Would you ride it? And he said, I will not only ride it, man. I'll, I'll race it every weekend, and I'll come back, and I'll tell you on Monday what worked and what didn't, and we can cut it up and do it again. And I'll ride it the next weekend. And he did that for probably six weeks until we got the shape better. And the this, this is a morph, and this shows what happened to the Roman. This is a Robert Egger prototype with the red tape. It was the first prototype we ever made at Specialized that you could actually ride. And the Egger prototype um, was quite comfortable. And when we, when we tested it at Specialized, and then took, I took it to Europe, and uh, people said, this is the best saddle we've ever ridden. And it was only Egger's first uh, attempt so the Roman saddle then evolved into this shape. And the shape is, as you know, I'm, I'm sure very important. And the kick up in the back of the saddle is, is a little different. So when I designed the saddle, the saddles that I saw on the market uh, started to kick up around the middle. And so the rider would tend to slide forward on the saddle, putting them on the narrower part of the saddle, the, front, the middle or the front part. And that was uncomfortable and created uh, problems with pressure and blood flow. So what we did on the Roman was we started the kick up here so that your pelvis is rotated forward, but you still have a longer seating area so that you're not sliding forward. The nose of the saddle is dropped, and the Roman Evo came along later and dropped another 15 degrees off of this. So, but this was our, our original design, and I took that, uh, actually I took the, the Egger prototype to Dr. Frank Summers' lab in Hamburg, Germany. I think at that time it was in, yeah, he was in Hamburg, okay. And um, this is Marcus, he was one of our testers, and uh, we were testing transcutaneous uh, oxygen and testing blood flow. And I have to say, I'm so impressed with uh, Austin because this is the very first place that we have ever been where people actually volunteered to do this test. But fit has been the key, and without fit, there isn't anybody that can do this test. So if another bike company tries to do this without standardizing fit, they, they, they will fail. And as you all know, fit is so totally important. We measure blood flow when you just raise the nose up five degrees and you'll lose 70%. And so just the angle of the seat, not, not even to talk about the length of the top tube and the rest of the fit is very, very important to make this product work. So fit now is the umbrella uh, that we all work under and it, it kind of uh, works together with all the products. Um, Let's see. Yeah, okay, I just said it. I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Andy Pruitt and he can talk to you about fit. Thank you. So this is an interesting guy. Well, first of all, I'm Dr. Andy Pruitt, the Boulder Center for Sports Medicine. I am an independent uh, medical consultant to specialize. So I actually have a day job um, and I, 13 years ago, first met Roger, 
Um, I had, at that time, probably six other uh, cycling industry uh, consulting contracts. And to kind of play on what Hill said, why would a guy like me that had six other consulting contracts hang my one and only star on a company like Specialized with a guy like Mike Sinyard? And I will tell you, it's because of Mike Sinyard and his driving passion for the sport, number one. Number two, it was his size and reach uh, of what I could, what my voice could go from my office of 20 or 30 people a day to 300 tonight and think how many people around the world. We've now trained uh, several thousand body geometry fitters. So it really took my voice and, and, and broadcast it around the world. And that was what really made me stake my claim um, and, and, and continue with Specialized. So there's a real partnership between the Boulder Center for Sports Medicine and the Big Red S. Uh, we do a lot of uh, research um, for the company. Um, I hold the body geometry shoe patent. Um, so there's a, there's a real synergy there between, between the two companies. And I do ride with um, uh, Mike quite a bit. I'm 63, Mike's 64. Um, he elmoed me the other day and said, can we do this till we're 70? I said, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, I still like riding my bike. I can't believe that I'm 63 years old and somebody still pays me to ride a bicycle. It's pretty exciting. Um, anyway, SIT has evolved as has technology. This is an interesting guy at the company. This is his actual bike. This is his actual gear. And with proper fit and with new equipment, his posture gets better. He actually gets more aerodynamic. He's in his late 50s as well. So the point is, is that fit as we get older, it doesn't mean we have to sit up like the Wicked Witch of the North, right? I mean, it, it, it fit is what it is. Fit is a, um, uh, a mirror of you. I was talking to a lady in the foyer before we started. She says, I've got a bad back. What's your best fit advice for me? Not enough information, right? And instead of TMI, this was TLI, too little information. I, I couldn't tell her enough, but it's all about that pre-fit examination and it all begins around saddle choice. So as we age, as we become injured, uh, regardless of age, as we become injured, bike fit is about making the bike look like you. So body geometry, as Roger said, is this over-encompassing arch in the company uh, of ergonomically designed and scientifically tested products. Shoes, footbeds, saddles, and we're going to talk about fit for a minute. So the body geometry fit, what a great name, right? I mean. So Roger had the Minkow wedge, and he had these great saddles back in the late 90s. I come along with this shoe, and we're struggling for this name. And somebody in the company said, you know, we used to have an apparel line called Body Geometry. We looked at each other and said, that's it. It, couldn't, it was a bad name for an apparel line. It was a great name for what Roger and I do. So this is the latest rendition of the logo. And one of the things I'm most proud of is, is the fact that what I've done in my office of developing fit over 40 years, I, I, I did my first bike fit back in an athletic training room at the University of Colorado. An injured cyclist came limping in when I was the head trainer at the university, and he had, uh, she had knee pain. Um, she had knee pain, and, and, and I had to kind of figure out backwards why she, her knee hurt when she rode her bicycle. And Body Geometry Fit was born at the University of Colorado, probably about 1979, based on an injured professional lady cyclist came to my office with knee pain, and we worked backwards and figured out that her cleats were in the wrong place and they were too rigid. This same person went on to win a gold medal in the 84 uh, Olympics. There's Connie Carpenter, Taylor Finney's mom. She's now, she's now more famous about being Taylor's mom than being the first gold medalist uh, uh, woman in, in, in cycling. But she knew that if she put more than one nail, remember when we nailed cleats, there's some bald, there's some no and gray hairs in here, who remember wool shorts, real chamois, real chamois, um, and that we nailed our cleats to the bottom of these wooden shoes. Connie knew that if she put more than one nail in her cleats, her knees hurt. She needed float. She was country before country was cool. We didn't know why she needed float in 1979. We just knew that she needed float. Okay, bike sizing versus bike fitting. There's a lot of confusion in the industry right now. Uh, Giant just launched this thing called the Right Ride. This is very clever, computerized, 
bike in your hand, you can move it all around, and they help, they help you buy a bike, basically. All done from the XY plane. Side view, this is XY, this is Z. So they've got this fancy computerized gizmo, it's really a lot of sizzle, and it helps you buy the right size bike. If I go into a relatively nice department store, I, am, I can be rest assured I'm going to leave there with the right size bike, if I, uh, the right size suit. If I take that suit to the tailor, I'm going to leave there with a well-fitting suit. There's a very big difference between bicycle sizing, done from the XY plane, and bicycle fitting, which is done in three dimensions. Body Geometry Fit is an educational process that is developed from the work I've done at the center. We took it to um, SBCU, which is Bi uh, Specialized Bicycle Components University. It's their educational uh, division of the company for educating dealers. Um, it happened kind of accidentally at a, at, a, uh, at a dealer meeting in Santa Cruz. Mike Sinyard is kind of nudging me, you know, we've got saddles, we've got shoes, we need some fitting tools. So we spent a year working with Ben Serrata, developing some very clever, over-engineered inseam measuring devices and some flexibility boards. And basically, all it did was assure us of a test ride success. It was bike sizing. I said, Mike, there's only one tool you need, and it's an educated fitter. We need a superb educational process that we can take global and change the world um, with bike fitting. He said, do it. And Body Geometry Fit was born uh, in that day. I'm very proud of this. Of, of this. It's one of, I hope to be one of my career legacies uh, in that we really are, I think, changing the world. We've driven companies like Cannondale and Giant to, to invest in Fit. Uh, Shimano is investing in Fit in Europe. Uh, you know uh, Trek has a Fit school. So that we force the industry although they're still off the back. We have forced the industry to give fit, real fit, um, uh, an eye. So body geometry fit um, uh, is three levels of education. Level one is relatively basic fit, learning all the anatomy, learning all of the, the biomechanics, and learning how to do a really good three-dimensional fit. There's the master's level, now called level two, which then begins to talk about aerodynamics and mountain biking and all the other, many of the other nuances. And then ultimately it's certification. And certification is a real pass-fail process. So if you go to a retool, which is another tool, right? I love it when, a, when, a, when an injured athlete comes into my office and says, where did, where did this position come from? Well, I got a retool fit. Who did it? Oh, I don't know. It was a retool fit. That's like saying I did a, you got a craftsman fit when you got your car fixed. Who did it? Don't you want to know who the mechanic was, not what kind of tool they were using? So um, retools, are, for example, although Todd Carver, the man that, that helped push the retool system, is one of my protégés, um, and I'm actually pretty proud of the work Todd's done, but nonetheless, it's a tool. And, and you get certified when you leave there. There's no practice. You walked in there three days before, had never done a bike fit before. Now you not only know how to use the technology, but you've had a couple of hours of bike fit training as well. And now you're certified. Well, I will tell you that a certified body geometry fitter is the real deal. Who are you going to call, the apprentice plumber or the certified plumber? Hopefully, you're going to call the certified plumber. And I push all of the aspiring bike fitters in the room, of which you're going to meet some of the guys from Bicycle Sports Shop later this evening, to become certified. It is, it is, you are a professional. A professional is someone who has a body of knowledge which separates you from the general public. And a true certified body geometry fitter is that person. Along with fit, it is a lot of the products. The shoes and the saddles uh, are driven by this process. And what we're looking for are fit solutions. So in, in this process of educating fitters around the world, they come back to us and say, what do we do with somebody who needs a more narrow stance? What do we need with somebody who needs more varus wedge than the shoe has built into it? So along come the body geometry uh, um, fit solutions. Hopefully you'll be able to find studios like this around your neighborhood, around Austin, at the Bicycle Sports Shop. Hopefully 
um, you will, that's where you will seek your fit advice. If we're going to talk a little bit about body geometry fit, just like I told the young woman in the uh, lobby this evening, it all begins with saddles. Step number one of the pre-fit assessment, there are 20 some odd steps in the pre-fit assessment, there's 15 odd steps of the actual on-bike fitting, is measuring the ischial tuberosities. And the position which she's sitting on a, a little thing we fondly call the assometer. Um, <laughs> And, and, and her position on it is really driven by what she's told us about her and her riding history. Oh, I'm a commuter, I ride in a very upright position. Or, you know, I'm primarily a time trialist, or I'm a roadie, I'm not. So we position them on this uh, device to help us give us some really good starting advice. Number one step of the on-bike is saddle choice. It all begins and works around the saddle. Moving through the fit process, one of the most important things we do is look at proprioception, balance, and strength. The one-third knee bend is the test I invented to kind of simulate the middle of the pedal stroke. How, am I, how can I balance on that little skinny bicycle seat? Can I hold my pelvis level? Can I hold my core level? Is my knee in the right place in association with my foot? The one-third knee bend tells us a lot. The picture on the, on the left, that's a pretty normal looking one-third knee bend. Her pelvis is level, she's got a little foot, uh, foot collapse, she has a little bit of valgus angulation, or a little bit of knock knee angulation in her knee. But her pelvis is level, she's not rotated. It tells me her core is fairly strong, her glutes are fairly strong. She has a very normal female lower extremity anatomy. However, when we switch to her other leg, her pelvis drops, she rotates, tells me that her core strength on that side is not quite as is good. Her glutes are weak, but her pelvis is dropping, uh, and she's really battling that arch collapse. Asymmetry. Are we perfect mirrors of each other? Can we run a bandsaw down the middle of us? No. XY fitting fails because they don't look at the Z plane. So proprioception, strength, balance, all those things are part of the prefit assessment. We take a lot of flexibility in measurements, and a lot of people don't understand you know, how does this relate to me sitting on my bicycle? Well, these measurements of, of, of straight leg raise and hip flexion are directly taken onto the bike and, and do guide us into uh, maximum and minimal availables. I firmly believe that a neutral bike position allows you to adjust to terrain, adjust to effort. Uh, if I've got my bike set up just to climb, then I'm not going to be in a very good place when it comes to the sprint. First time I met Tom Boone, and I looked at his bike, and I said, my, that is the funniest looking bike I've ever seen. He had his handlebars rolled up so high. Remember those old steering wheel knobs on, the, on, on trucks? It looked like he had his brake hoods rolled up like two steering wheel knobs. I said, mm, I'm seeing him for knee pain, right? I'm seeing Tom for knee pain, but I, I, I can't take my eye off this bike. I said, Tom, tell me about your bike position. Well, I've got it set up for the last three kilometers. That's where I can get, you got to get to the last three kilometers. What about the first 200 kilometers? And that was one of the, it took me a while to convince him that he will be fresher and faster if we set his bike up in a neutral position to allow for that. So these measurements help us find that neutral position. One of the most important kinds of cycling where these measurements are crucial to us is time trialing in triathlon. Think about hip flexion and your ability to get aero, the ability to get aerodynamic. So in a long distance triathlon, we need to build a big buffer in there. Because if you're hitting the end of your range of motion 90 times a minute for several, four, five, six hours, you're gonna become uncomfortable. I love it when they say, I couldn't run when I got off my bike. Well, of course not. They were far too aggressive in that position. They'd been hitting the end range of those tendons for that whole bike ride and they couldn't quite stand up when they got to the run portion. So depending on the length of the triathlon and the length of the time, so a prologue position for a guy like Mark Cavendish is going to be different than a hour TT position for Alberto Contador. They're in the same race. Does Mark Cavendish care about the hour time trial? He's trying to survive it and make the time cut. Does he care about the prologue? Could he get the yellow jersey the first day or two? Absolutely. And we've been doing so the measurements taken in the prefit assessment drive us to the end position. Bike fit is an interesting technology. 
If you think about Formula One, the technology begins at the racetrack, Honda, Mercedes, the McLaren, all of those technologies are born at the racetrack and somewhere two to five years later, they end up in your Prius. Well, maybe not the Prius. Yeah. <laughs> they, they end up in a car that you're gonna drive. Bike Fit has gone the other direction. It's gone from the doctor's office to the retailer to Cycling's Formula One or the Pro Tour. And we've had the great pleasure over the last years to validate the work we've done. I will tell you that when we work with, I think all of the examples tonight are from Quick Step. And that was purely coincidental. I was thinking about the athlete, their problem, and how we got to their position. And they all happen to be Quick Step riders now. They're purely purely accidental. I worked with um, Quickstep, Astana, and, and, and Saxo Bank. Uh, some of the early successes we had at the Pro Tour were with Saxo Bank. Um, one, one year I was helping coach Andy Schleck how to beat Alberto, and the next year they switched teams, and, I, and I'm sitting there coaching Alberto how to beat Andy. Uh, so I kind of knew their strengths and weaknesses very well, because I'd studied lots of hours of tape of both of these guys, but you know, when, they, when the players switch teams on you, um, suddenly you're you're coaching against a guy you kind of grew to like. But the, the Pro Tour is our validation. And I want to give you three fun examples tonight. One is Tom Boonen. So I met for Tom first with a knee injury in 2008, and we laughed at his funny bike position. And we, we, but we made his knee pain go away by BGIzing his North Wave shoes. Body geometry izing. We put arch support and varus into his North Wave shoes and resolved his knee pain. He was pretty sold at that time. But he had a long-term contract, money, money talked in those days, and we weren't paying anybody to ride our shoes. We still pay very few to ride our shoes. Um, Specialized is the number one shoe in the Pro, Pro Tour Peloton. We have over 100 riders that ride our shoes in the Pro Tour, uh, Pro Tour Peloton, and we pay 25 of them. So 75 of those guys are buying their own shoes somewhere. Or maybe they're getting them free. Uh, but anyway, Tom Boonen um, had a tough patch between 2008 in 2011. Had a tough go, didn't he? He had a few physical problems, he partied a little hard, um, he had a, had a rough patch in his career. He shows up for camp uh, about Thanksgiving in uh, Leuven University in Belgium, 2011, and he walked in and it was like I recognized his face, but he was this ripped superhero. And we shook hands, we exchanged pleasantries, and he said, I am here with a blank slate, do it to me. Talk about responsibility. Um, he's wanting to make a comeback. Um, there's a, this huge, he has invested this huge body change uh, and commitment coming into the fall camp. You think, what can you do with a guy like Tom Boonin to make him faster? We found things in the pre-fit assessment that actually made him faster. So the first thing were to really he, he, was, he was happy to be on the body geometry shoes. and We customized the body geometry shoes, absolutely. One of the things in the middle of this whole thing, I said, why are you in 46 centimeter handlebars? He said, my junior coach gave them to me and told me I would grow into them. <laughs> really good advice these guys get, right? He never grew into them. He's six foot two, he is a manly beast, but he doesn't have wide shoulders. To make a long story short, we measured in, in the velodrome the amount of watts it takes for Tom to go 30 miles an hour for an extended period of time on 46s and on 44s, and it saved him 25 watts. You know how long it takes a guy like Tom Boonin to gain 25 watts in training, and all he had to do was trade handlebars? He wrote it for a week. I called him. I said, Tom, what do you think of the bar? He said, I, I, I don't even know that they're different except that my sprint turnover got faster. Think about a lever, right? Big, long lever. His sprint turnover actually got faster. He didn't notice any change in his physiometry because of the more narrow bars. They were the right size for him, and we saved him 25 watts. Pretty, pretty cool stuff. We took Tom to a variety of places. So fit is a very dynamic thing. It doesn't have to always happen in the lab. So we were invited, pretty cool stuff, if you like Perry Roubaix. We were invited to the uh, Tom Boonen pre-Perry Roubaix camp. 
and the semi shows up. There's this fleet of guys, and all this technology, and one rider. Um, and, the, you know, the whole motorhome deal rolls up. And what we're there to do, and we took two body geometry traders, me and Scott Holtz, the guy that runs the whole, body, the whole SBCU program, northern Belgium in the middle of the, middle of the winter, to monitor what kind of positional changes occur on Tom as he transitions from flat tarmac onto pave. He says, this is what I think I do. And do I need to change my position for Perry roubaix Neutral bike fitting allows you to adjust for all these things. I said, I don't think so, but I guess we need to prove it to this guy. So we went there, filmed him, and all these different transitions. And the bottom line is, all he does is he transitions from tarmac to pave, is goose it. Goes from 300 watts to 500 watts as he transitions from smooth, smooth pavement onto the, onto the tarmac, the, or onto the pave. The neutral position, we'd had him in for about six weeks now, no change, no change in position for Perry Roubaix. You see him in his little fake um, time trial position here. We're in the velodrome measuring watt output at a variety of different speeds, and he has to sustain these speeds in the velodrome for a long enough time to know whether this position is sustainable or not, right? So if I put him in a really aggressive position and he can't stay there, what good is it? So we had, we had known for some time, we're going to tell some secrets here, don't tell anybody, right? Don't tell anybody this. That on the brake hoods, with your arms bent, it's significantly more aerodynamic than with your arms in the drops. My torso didn't change, right? So here I am, my hands are on my brake hoods, my forearms are kind of laying on the bars. That's far more aerodynamic than if I don't change and put my hands on the drops. Now, which one's architecturally easier to maintain? This one. This is far easier to maintain than this. My triceps are holding me up. But this is 20 or 30 watts faster, right? So in the middle of the test, I've got a little radio in his helmet, and he's here, and I see his triceps creeping up. He's not liking it down there very much. And I said in his, said in his, you know, in his radio, Tom, um, you know, keep your elbows bent. And he looked at me as he went by and, said, and, <laughs> and, and dropped into this position, which suddenly his watts came way down and his speed didn't change. So if you go back and look at the last 30 kilometers of the 2012 Perry Roubaix, where he rode off the front by himself, you can see Tom calculating in his head. Here's what I have to do to maintain this getaway speed. And he's looking at the pavement and the, and the pave and the tarmac. He knows when he has to be down here. He knows when he can do this little good business. And he knows when he can do that. And you can see it. He's changing his position throughout that 30K breakaway as he's thinking about what we've learned in the velodrome and the pre perry Roubaix testing. So body geometry fit neutral positioning, minimize the adaptation, minimize adaptation. Adaptation is when you get hurt. Adaptation is when you lose focus and when you lose energy. So what happens? Good shoes, good saddle, um, neutral fit, you ride off the front of Perry roubaix um, And, and it's, it makes for a pretty, pretty exciting day. Okay. A little less, well, it's almost exciting. This is Sylvain Chavanel. Saban Chavanel shows up at camp six days after having spine surgery. Six days after having spine surgery. And you can see all the stackers I've got on his top tube here. And you see how grumpy he is? He's a grumpy Frenchman. He said, I am a professional. I cannot ride this position. I said, no, you're not a professional. You are a back patient today. Here is your position, dude. Your prefit assessment, this is your position. <laughs> you, know, you know how to speak French? Ha ha! That's how you speak French. So all you have to do is show up and out, and I'd get a good laugh. I'd go, ha! Anyway, so I said, here's your rehab goals. Here's what you need to do this week. If you achieve this goal, you can take out a spacer. If you, and then we get marching on. The next time I saw him was about mm, 60 days, I think, something like that. 60 days post surgery. Look, two biggest differences. That, and that. He's no longer crabby. He's a smiling Frenchman. So his fit was a progress, in a work in progress. We went from six days post-surgery, 60 days post-60 days post-surgery, to when he's in his traditional old XY plane position, 
the, continued to work with it. And the really coolest thing is, is that three months later, he wins the stage race, three days at Dupont, in the penultimate time trial stage is where he won the race. So the, the, the theme of his story is, fit is dynamic. It is ever changing. Does your April position have to be your June position? Depends on what you did in the winter, doesn't it? Does my post-injury position, if I haven't, if I have, have gone away and had kids, had a family, had a job change, I've been off the bike for two years, can I expect to jump back on my bike in the garage? And expect it to be comfortable and, and be uh, the position I belong in? No. Fit is dynamic. Um, I'm 63 years old, was a fairly good bike racer in my youth. And my position has evolved, definitely has evolved. Um, I did some good core work, did some good stretching. I've got it almost back to where I was at age 40, but I'll never get back to, I'm, I'm not gonna be age 40, I can't, I can't do that. So bike fit is definitely uh, an evolving thing. I love this story. And I put this in there because we're better to do this presentation in Germany in a couple of weeks. Bert Graps. Bert was the 2009 World TT Champion. He is a beast of an old East German guy. Comes out of the old East German um, uh, training, training regime. He comes to camp with his vascular surgeon in tow. He has just been told he has bilateral femoral artery entrapment and fibrosis. The big arteries that feed your lower legs were fibrosed. And it's very common in cycling from being in this position all those years. He said, you're my last hope. <sighs> no responsibility here again. Bert was scheduled for surgery. Fit was his last avenue. I said, well, if you truly have endofibrosis of your, iliac, uh, of your femoral artery, fit is not going to change it. If it's transient and it's positional, we might be able to help you. So during Bert's pre-fit assessment, I noticed that he rides pigeon-toed, I apologize for the logo, he rides pigeon-toed, big humped back. On exam, he stands and sits duck-footed. And I said, why do you ride like this? My East German coaches told me I must ride pigeon-toed and knees to the top tube. Think about his femoral arteries right here. And I must get as low in the front as possible on a saddle significantly too narrow for him. So what we do? We raised the front end of his bike. We changed his cleat position. We widened his stance significantly and put him on a body geometry saddle. See that change? He got more aerodynamic. Here we go. Had some habits to break. His knees are not knock kneed anymore, and he's surely not pigeon toed anymore. He was so excited. He had his best training ride in, in, in months that day. He said, I know I'll probably never be world time trial champion again, but the TT bike is pretty darn important for me. Are, do any of these changes carry over to the TT bike? And I said, we were not ready to launch the Sotero at that time. This is last January in, in um, Mallorca. Um, and actually, <laughs> I had a Sotero in a brown paper bag. And, and I said, well, I think I have something for you. <laughs> think about where you sit on the Sotero. And that, so to get, we, we, we really sit on the nose of the, of the Sotero on our pubic rami. And for a guy, you just kind of dangle your dangly bits off the, front of the, of, off the front of the saddle. So I've widened his stance. I've towed him out. And now I've got nothing, no nose of the saddle in his crotch. We raised the front of his time trial, which, time trial bike, which actually made him more aerodynamic. I mean, there, there's been a lot of what I've learned on the velodrome and in the wind tunnel. Low, ain't, low is not necessarily fast. We raised him up, made him more narrow. Narrow is more important than low. And the guy is railing. He's been top 10 in, in several World Tour uh, time trials this season. He's riding, riding pain-free. No, no dysfunction in his quads or vascular system. So with all of this, they say to us, is there any way to, is there a, 
we're seeing it, we're hearing it. Is there a way to measure performance outcomes based on fit? Don't know. Let's see. So the, the, the premise was, um, it, can, we take, can we isolate the, the body geometry fit and measure if it, has, if it has significant performance results? The hypothesis was rather bold, as hypotheses should be, right? They should be bold. Uh, we're going to improve power at lactate threshold, and lactate threshold is that steady state. I can do this for an hour. We're going to improve your power at, at that. Uh, and we're going to uh, decrease physiological cost. In other words, decrease oxygen cost, lower heart rates, all those kind of things. And you'll increase your power in a time trial and make your time trial faster. Pretty, pretty bold uh, hypothesis. So Boulder is a pretty, uni pretty unique cycling place, a lot like Austin. And so we send out a Twitter or tweet or, and a Facebook post that we're looking for test subjects. Well, they come in droves, right? I mean, they, oh, you can, you can test me. Um, and we had to find a number of body geometry virgins, people that had never had a bike fit, uh, who didn't own any body geometry products, who were willing to go through this process, a uh, rather stringent uh, physiological testing process. And in the middle of it, they would go through the body geometry process and be, and be retested. So we know that familiarization is key and, and that your very first big advances in, in performance come the first time you test it. So we actually put them through a familiarization. They actually went through testing, went through the 10K time trial, got familiar with the whole thing, and then came back, actually did the test. It's max VO2, lactic threshold, wind gate. Then they did a computerized 10 kilometer time trial, um, all this time drawing blood, blah, 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 blah. At the end of that day, they went through uh, the body geometry fit process with a certified body geometry fitter in my office, Charles Van Atta. Uh, I'm not in the room, I'm not even in the building. I have nothing to do with these things. So Charles puts them through the whole body geometry fit process. They go away for a week. We control their diet, their nutrition, their training. So we, we've eliminated every variable that we can possibly eliminate. We actually take their shoes and parts away from them so they can't go back to it. They come back, they go through the exact same battery of tests again. The results are at threshold power, body geometry fit was worth nine and a half watts. Takes you a long time to gain nine and a half watts just from a bicycle fit. Shouldn't you be in that good position anyway? Submaximal uh, VO2, there was no change. In other words, there was really no physiological cost to these free nine watts. Heart rate didn't change. So the, the bottom line is there was really no you know, cost at, at that. So how, what about max? At max, nine watt improvement. So from 300 watts to 309 watts. These, these subjects had to be trained cyclists. I mean, these were not just slugs off the, off the, obviously, 300 watts and 309 watts. These were not, these were real cyclists. Um, again, no physiological cost. So these are other than the cost of the fit, free watts. Time trial. Average power at the time trial went up 11 watts. Why is it more? Because it's a short, hard, intense effort. So 11 watts, time, average time in the time trial went down by 34 seconds. Fairly significant. This is a road bike time trial. This is not an aerodynamic. And again, no physiological change. Bottom line is, at lactate threshold and at max, there was a, a watt increase without physiological cost. I think the cool thing is that this is now available around the world in, in body geometry fit studios and, and, and specialized stores. One of the things most close to my heart and how I got connected with the company was with shoes. Um, Roger came to me in 99, the first shoe model was 2000, something like that, and he said, you know, I've got this cool saddle, and we're having all this success, and we're thinking about doing some shoes. Uh, he'd also been working on gloves. He said, what would you do with shoes? And I kind of told him what I had been doing with shoes over my decades of work. And he said, well, I don't want to do that. You need to do that. So he introduced me to the guys that specialize, and make a long story short, here we are today. So I'm very uh, uh, excited about the shoes that we produce. They are the only biomechanically correct shoe on the market, period. About 90% of all humans have certain foot characteristics that 
the, the characteristics built into the body geometry shoe actually are advantageous for. All of the shoes in the market are for nobody. They have to be customized, or if you don't customize them, I guarantee you there's a performance and a fit loss to you. So the body geometry shoes have a 1.5 millimeter varus wedge built into the forefoot. It's only in the forefoot, it's not the whole shoe. We build a longitudinal arch into the outsole. We blend it then with an insole that comes in with a metatarsal arch and, and a, uh, a custom cho cho chosen um, arch support. So where, are we, where is the only place we're actually connected to the bike? I said saddle choice is number one, and it is crucial. The whole world revolves around our pelvis. Teenage boys have thought that forever. We now, we now know it for a fact that saddle choice and, and the world resolves, revolves around that. But the only place we're actually connected to the bike is the shoe. Body geometry shoes, again, here is going to show the, the uh, footbed. It's going to show the forefoot varus uh, right here. The inside of the shoe is thicker than the outside of the shoe. That's the whole angulation in the forefoot. And then the longitudinal arch is built into the outsole. There are a lot of copycats out there. There's a lot of shoes trying to look like this. Um, they don't act like this. So what is forefoot angulation? It's part of the normal walking gait. So if we look at the great toe, it's higher in, in, in a level plane than the little toe. So what happens with forefoot angulation that's uncorrected is that the knee collapses toward the top two. You have all seen it on a club ride. You have all ridden behind someone, or you've noticed it in yourself, that uncontrolled medial lateral knee travel. The very first biomechanical studies we did back in 2000, uh, the whole goal was to sh prove that the body geometry shoe could, could diminish this motion. It was to, to, to diminish and control this motion. The goal, obviously, is then that we get a knee going up and down like a piston, uh, up and down like a piston, not one that's doing a figure eight or has lots of medial lateral excessive knee trouble. That is the solution that we found for Tom Boone. Anybody recognize anybody in this photo? That's Alberto Contador, sitting in the middle of a shoe design meeting. We take what we learn from these guys very seriously. Um, we built a whole new last around the current generation of shoes. The last is the model that the shoemakers actually build uh, the shoe around. It was 47 prototypes, or some, it, it, well over, almost 50 different prototypes went in to developing the, the current uh, iteration of the body geometry shoes. Uh, one, one pair, this is made out, totally out of duct tape and, and carbon fiber. It weighed nothing. It was also pretty uncomfortable. Um, so blending, uh, blending comfort. So think about, here's, here's a, in walking, the foot is a flexible lever. In cycling, we're asking that lever to be a rigid lever. So we've got to do everything we can do to help that foot be a rigid lever. And so the word orthotic means corrective device. So a cycling shoe, even the worst cycling shoe, is an orthotic in some ways because it's helping you control that flexible foot and make it a more rigid lever. We put a, a pressure map inside the shoe. We could see where the foot was driving into that shoe on that pedal to produce power. It allowed us to design what we call the power line, which allowed us to take material away from the shoe where it's no longer needed. That's why the bottom of the new shoes look like they do. It's, it's, there's stiffness where it needs to be. There's no material where it doesn't need to be, which makes them the lightest, stiffest shoes in the market. The front of the shoe is adaptive so that it can kind of work around the lumps and bumps of your forefoot, while the material in the back of the shoe is absolutely non-stretch, absolutely supportive. Um, and the two are welded together in a, a, a process unbeknownst to me, but there's no seams, no stitches. They are welded together in the middle of the foot. The footbeds are the piece that marry the foot to the shoe. It is a, a custom chosen uh, with the body geometry fit technician to help you choose the right size, the right amount of arch support, and the amount of wedges that go with it. And I think they're a pretty cool looking shoe too. Although today, I was riding with the shop ride in a pair of pure white prototypes, um, and the guy's asking, where did we, we get that pure white one? 
Um, and the truth of the matter is, I don't have any new ones. I'm still riding the old prototype. It's like the cobbler, the cobbler himself has no shoes. So then the, the, so the shoe guys got so excited about the study we did for body jammer the fit, they said, what portion of that is the connection between the foot and the pedal? I, obviously, I believe in the Z-plane. I believe it's a huge portion of the overall uh, power improvement comes from that connection to the pedal. So we were, we were hired to do a study. It's the exact same physiological battery, exact same familiarization. So I'm not going to bore you with that again. But it's by, basically the body geometry S-work shoe out of the box. No optimization, no fitting, no optimization. It is, does this, is this the right size body geometry shoe for you, and then with a competitor's shoe of the same value. So it's a $400 competitor's shoe. You can figure out who that is if you like. Um, uh, again, not optimized. It does have some customization abilities, but neither, neither were optimized. The body geometry shoe, average watts were 310. Competitor shoe, average watts were 303. So there's a body geometry, oops, body geometry shoes produce 6.5 more watts out of the box than did the competitor's shoe. Time trial results, uh, average time for 10 kilometers was 16.5 uh, uh, versus 16.12, so a seven second reduction in time trial for this particular group of subjects um, just based on the shoe out of the box. Body geometry in general, for, from Roger and I's perspective and from the company's perspective, is all about enhancing the, the performance and mostly all, most of all, enhancing that experience of that rider. Um, I, I, it's about being comfortable is fast. Comfortable fast does not have to be uncomfortable. Comfortable, comfortable can be fast. Um, we want you riding longer. We want, we, we want you out there. We want the Chinese riding. We want the Koreans riding. We want the, where are we going next month? Germans riding. <laughs> we want, where are we going next month? We want month? the English riding. Um, it is, it is <coughs> we're on this, um, Crusade, uh, worldwide crusade to make people more comfortable on bikes. On my parting shot is this. On May 26th, we had a day, a special day for body geometry. These four people are true body geometry um, spokespeople. Tony Martin uh, is a guy I met um, under pure duress. He did not want to be there. His manager drug him to see me. And he showed up an hour late, which doesn't set well with me. His time's no more important than mine. I'd flown to Europe to see this clown. So we got off to a really bad start. He said he wasn't going to change anything. Everything was going great. And his manager said, you got dropped last week in the climb. Least give this man the opportunity. We went through the whole process. He had been retooled. Uh, he was three centimeters in front of what we considered to be a neutral position. Blah, blah, blah. He agreed to ride it for a week. Weeks have turned into months. He's regained his uh, world championship in the time trial. He is absolutely a fan of body geometry. Mark Cavendish, oh, what a, that, that's a story we don't have time for tonight. He's the reason Shimano now makes pedal spindles four millimeters longer. Because he needed four millimeters of stance width so his ankle bone didn't smash his crank arm when he's producing 1,500, 1,600 watts in a sprint. Yeah, the, the numbers I said were right. <laughs> um, he needed four millimeters of, of axle length. Finally got Shimano's attention. Now they produce a Cavendish pedal. Uh, and, and, and they're two top line. Uh, so he's a big fan of body geometry. Vincenzo Nibali, if you've been following um, YouTube, I worked with Sean, Sean Matson, one of our uh, body geometry fitters, head of the program in Morgan Hill, has spent endless hours in the velodrome with Vincenzo Nibali. What did he just do recently? He wins the tour, uh, wins the Giro. Carmen Small, I mean, Carmen Small, she's, she's getting at the end of her career, we've absolutely resurrected her career with body geometry fit, all on the same day. It's all happened on the same day, May 26th. Tony Martin wins the Tour of Belgium. Cavendish wins the last stage of the Giro. Nibali wins the overall Giro. And Carmen Small wins the USTT Championships, professional championships, all in the same day. It was quite a day for body geometry and specialized. Um, that is it for me. Wow, thank you. You're very welcome. Well, it's amazing. <clears throat> So
So it stands to reason that if you're at St. Ed's on a Friday night at a little after eight, listening to these two fine gentlemen tell you a little bit about what they do and why they do it, you're really into this stuff. And you probably have a couple of questions. I was one of the folks who got to go ride with Dr. Pruitt this morning. Um, I only was brave enough to ask two questions. One was, when he's out on a ride, can he turn it off? Can he turn off being Dr. Pruitt and just ride and not look at people and go, uh, 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 uh. no, he can't. <laughs> I worked so hard to ride perfectly all morning that I had to take a nap this afternoon just from trying to ride like perfectly straight and position properly you on the bike. You look good. I sat on your wheel quite thanks, a bit. Thanks. Thanks. The other question was, was I asked for the white shoes. So that was, that was my only other question. But I'm sure somebody in here must have a question. Anybody? Raise a hand. I'll hand you a microphone so everybody can hear and we can Ladies first. have a few questions. Absolutely. Ladies first and first hand up. Hi. I, I'm a, I do triathlons more than anything, but I have a question about the uh, length of uh, the crank because I went from great question I know this is this is kind of crazy on my road bike I ride like a 170 and on my on my uh, time trial bike I ride a 150 yep so a great question the question is about crank length the research is really clear that unless crank lengths are are, are absolutely silly short or silly long there's absolutely no performance change in the middle zero zero so Part of body geometry fit would be to determine what the best crank arm length for you would be based on your height, based on your femoral length, based on hip impingement, lots of those things. So um, all a bit longer crank arm does is make you pedal a bigger circle. So in the triathlon bike where you want to get aero, you want to actually pedal a smaller circle so that you can actually get a little bit more aero. You can actually go back and forth between the two uh, and within, you know, 100 pedal strokes, your body has gone, oh, she's on a road bike. Oh, she's on a triathlon bike. So there's absolutely no reason you cannot go back and forth. There's no performance loss with it. The whole idea behind time trial and triathlon positioning is that we know there are some aerodynamic gains, but there are physiological costs to those aerodynamic gains. You cannot produce as much power in an aerodynamic position. So the key is finding that marriage between aerodynamics and continuing to produce power. So in, when we, of course, we have wind tunnels and, and velodromes and telemetry and all kinds of things to help us. But we know that, that, that um, narrow is very important. Low is not, you're, you're small anyway. You're going to be arrow just by your nature. Um, so I'm not sure what the question was. It was about crank arm length. And is it OK to go back and forth? With 150, you can, you can easily get more aerodynamic. But what distance triathlon do you do? But the, you feel better when you get to the run because you haven't been banging away at the end range of your hip range of motion with that long crank arm. That's why you feel better on the run. So the key is do, it, do a, um, um, uh, a downhill coasting test. You find just a fairly calm day, a straight stretch of road, put marks on the road, and time yourself coasting down from start to finish in, in, in several different positions. Uh, and take your comfortable position first, see what that time is. Take your most aggressive, oh, I can do this for a while. Take that one, and the truth's going to be in the middle somewhere um, of the, 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 the marriage of comfort, aerodynamics, and, and, and power output. That's the cheapest way for, for you to do that on your own. Great question. Is there a good Long question? answer. How do you deal with the fact that people have v different widths in their feet? I mean, you're, you're manufacturing and, and the retail aspects of that are that you have one shoe with one width in, a, in different sizes. Um, but how does the width of the foot uh, affect the efficiency of the shoe? And, and, and it's, if it's all about fit, how come width is not con a consideration? It is a consideration. We do have. Uh, narrows, standards, and wides in some of the sizes. Am I right? No? Yeah. So the specialized shoe does come in three choices of widths. Um, in Europe, they sell a whole lot more than arrows, especially the pro guys. They'll jam their foot into anything. Um, kind of like hobbled Chinese women. I mean, they, they stuff their feet into these little things. Um, 
So f width is a concern, and we try to fit the, the bell-shaped curve. The whole idea behind taking what I do in the doctor's office and, and trying to manufacture it for the general public is hitting the bell-shaped curve. And if you've got an incredibly wide or narrow foot, or a very prominent fifth metacarpal, or a big bunion, we're not going to make you happy uh, in a store-bought shoe that's not punched out in, in, in some way. Uh, and for that, I apologize. Um, the custom shoe choices have gotten really slim because the market's so small. The shoe manufacturers have done such a good job of, of making everybody out there happy at somewhere. CD makes a mega. That thing is just like you could live in it. Um, so there, there, there are, I think there are enough variations on the market. Now, in the material choices, we tried to leave the front third of the shoe malleable so that blumps and bumps and things could be adapted for, while the supportive part of it to be not so malleable. So um, I don't know if that's a satisfactory answer for you or not, but there are three choices in the specialized shoe in, in, the, in line of the widths, and the guys can get them for you, for sure. Thank you. Doctor, on that note, with your shoes, what is the function of the metatarsal uh, component of the footbed? I moved from one of the competitor line shoes, yep. which were like riding on, you know, um, blocks of wood, to, uh, to one of your shoes this, this year, and I, I like it. My riding is, is um, you know, get out there and, you know, for fitness and occasional yep. triathlon. And I noticed that um, I liked I like the shoe, and I like the foot insert. However, uh, the right foot tended to, um, I don't know, just kind of be sore around the forefoot yep. on the, the right side. And, and I thought, you know, this is, I, I, you know, I like the shoe, but if I'm not walking and flexing, what's the function of that metatarsal? And then right, what could I do to modify you what are, I have so I don't have You still have some, some discomfort in the forefoot. Yes, on the okay. right side. After riding. So, how many of you here have seen the old Lane Bryant Brazier commercial? Lift and separate, right? <laughs> so, the whole idea behind the metatarsal button is to lift and separate the bones of the forefoot. There's a nerve artery and vein that lay between each one of those long bones of the foot under the ball of the foot. And if we, it's the whole idea behind the metatarsal button is lift and separate those guys to keep from compressing the nerve artery and vein. You either need more metatarsal button, which would be my speculation, or more arch support. So if we pick up more pressure in the arch itself, we'll take pressure off of the forefoot. So um, I think you either probably need more metatarsal button, which you go to the drugstore and add a, little, add a little piece of felt in there to give yourself a little bit more lift and a little more separation, or you actually need more arch support to actually take you off the ball of the foot. That's number one. Number two. Maybe that's one and two. Number three is you could experiment with, and I would highly suggest you move your cleats backwards and your feet forward a few millimeters uh, to take some pressure off your forefoot. Again, no uh, performance detriment to shortening that foot lever to a point of diminishing return. I had a recent um, uh, patient who was a bilateral trans midfoot amputee, frostbite, mountaineering guy. He'd lost both of his feet from the midfoot forward. And um, he's a beast. Uh, he's gotten custom made shoes. So his, his cleats are probably that far in front of his heel. He still has just a little bit of a flipper so he can actually ankle and you know, customize his stroke at the top and bottom um, with no power loss in this guy. Funny little walker when he gets off the bike. But. I'm going to give you the mic, and then if you could pass it down. Um, have you thought about offering the fit courses for um, like medical personnel, physical Ooh. therapists, things like that, versus just a shop? Yeah, great question. Um, so the question is, have we thought about adding a um, uh, medical professional, physical therapist, chiropractors? Um, it's really not my decision. It's really a company decision. And Specialized is an incredible backer of independent bicycle dealers, IBDs. And if we kind of get stuck there because of their allegiance to the independent bike dealer, we kind of get stuck there. And um, that we can't open the classes to non-specialized dealers, such as physical therapists, et cetera. 
And it, it, it's such a conundrum for me because that's where I came from. <laughs> it's what I do every day. Um, I have taken my physical therapy staff and actually one of my physician partners and trained them in the process. They're now doing medical fi fits. And so to me, it's really sad that all the other fit schools out there that don't approach the Z plane are the only ones available to medical professionals currently. I am hoping to, so we encourage the body geometry fitters around the world to establish a relationship with medical professionals in their community. And one of the ways to do that would be to offer some bike fit education to those, those professionals. So my, my plug to the company has been, why don't we let shops nominate medical professionals in their community that they want to work with to be able to attend fit school? And that's kind of in the, that's going to be my, I'm trying <laughs> to get my medical brethren in, into, um, so yeah. But do, do I want to, if you're a physical therapist, do I want to set you up in town as a physical therapist to compete with the shop? Right. No, I don't. And because I think I think bicycle fitting belongs in the bike shop. Um, I'm the end of the road. When, when they show up for me, they have exhausted their retail fitter. They've retail, they've exhausted their local medical professional, and they are. I am the end of the road for these people. Right, and that's where I'm commonly getting people to. Um, and and so I'm looking for a way to enhance my training or what to look for. Yeah. Because a lot of these people have gotten fits given. Yep. I right. think it's the people with the odd anatomical whatever. Yep, sure, sure. So, I would encourage you to latch on to one of the young men that, or young, young people that you get introduced to tonight and see if you can't form a bond. That'd be my, that's what I encourage them to do is to seek guys like you out. So I'm encouraging you to seek them out. And am I trying to push the company to open the door to medical professionals? I am. I am. I even thought about, because REIT, so Specialized has a significant financial investment in Retool. Significant financial investment in Retool. Um, and they are, and I'm pushing Retool now to do a better job of measuring Z-plane, you know, to be more body geometry friendly. We're working on some absolutely specific branded, you know, body geometry Retool combined efforts. Um, so they have a fit school. So maybe, maybe that's where I should need to teach medical professionals is over there at, at Retool. I don't know. So, but again, I'm trying for you. I, I hear you. You have a question about the uh, difference between body f geometry fit as a method and the body geometry products. So in your presentation, you mentioned a lot of things about people that come in and had fit and products. And could you talk a little bit about what was just associated with the fit process alone and improvement scene? I'm so sorry? Could you talk a little bit about uh, people that came in and, and got benefits just out of the fit as Absolutely. a process? So in the study? Yes. So they, the, the fit for the study subjects was maximized. So we used body geometry products to maximize those fits. Um, had we used a brand X shoe, I would have attempted to make that brand X shoe whatever that customer needed. Right? I mean, so we would have body geometry eyesed brand X. Would I have gotten the same result? And the, and the answer I can tell you is no, because the soul of brand X does not have the extrinsic longitudinal arch built into the outsole. So I don't care what I put inside it, it's never going to be quite the same as having it built intrinsically into the shoe. So Roger was the first guy to, to say body geometry needed to be ergonomically designed. It had, so the process, it has to be, it has to, we had, we're trying to solve a Tell them. You know, what we found was that uh, the, the products need to be designed correctly, but Without BG fit, they aren't going to work as well. And so it's just like Andy's study. I mean, you, you might get 50% uh, benefit from the product, but you're going to get the other 50% when the person's actually fitted to the bike properly. Yeah. So it all sort of works as one system now, and that works a lot better. Before, we were just designing products without thinking about how they related to the other products or how they related to the whole concept of uh, how the rider sits on the bike. I mean, the, the products become solutions. They become fit solutions. So we have the problem first, and then we design the solution, and it becomes a 
becomes a product. Okay, thank you. Yep, thank you. Um, a question about the difference in male and female pelvises. Did you find when measuring and examining the pelvis, like the way that men and women sit or the way that the pelvis is structured, is it any different anatomically and how did that affect any sort of saddle design? I mean, there, there is a difference in women's pelvis. There's a range for men and women and the range is around from 95 millimeters to maybe 150 millimeter uh, sit bone width or ischial tuberosity width. Women are generally one centimeter wider than men at the back, at the back. Um, so what, when, we, when we size our, our saddles, in the beginning, uh, we thought it was extreme to go to a 155. Now we've got 168s. And so we're trying to uh, measure ischial tuberosities over hundreds of people around the world, different, different ethnic groups, and men and women, to find out exactly where we should go. But now we think we've got a range that will fit women as well as men quite, quite adequately. But yeah, there is a difference. And um, it's just like on the women's cutout. I mean, the women's cutout is specifically designed for them. So in the beginning, women were, were using kind of hand-me-down products from the men's, men's side. Now the women's side is, is designed for them. It's just like the triathletes have always had hand-me-down products. Now with the Cetero, all, all of a sudden, bang, we designed it for their riding position, for their anatomy. It's different. And so it's about time. It's overdue. Uh, but we're getting there. We're yeah. trying. But the overlap between genders is, is, is so amazing, the amount of overlap. Um, we've asked, they don't put pink flowers on the girl saddles anymore because there's so many guys riding them. Uh, and there's so many girls riding men's saddles. So, you know, like women, men are not all created equal. And, and so your stuff comes in different sizes and shapes and, and bulk and non-bulk. And so the Aura saddle, which is the women's iteration of the, of the Roman, has a significantly more ample middle cutout. But what's interesting is so the guys that need that 168, 155, they, a lot of them are riding the Aura and not the Roman because they, they like that more ample and, and beveled cutout. The Lithia is a, started out as a comfort saddle. It's a dual density saddle, meaning like a box springs and mattress. It's a little bit softer on the top layer, a little bit firm on the bottom layer with a really ample um, hour shaped ladies cutout. The first time I used it on a guy, he was a prostate cancer survivor, and he had a lot of scar right where your stuff is. And, and um, man, it was like, it was just, lights went off. And so now all my prostate sufferers, the, the lithia is the, is the go-to saddle for those guys. Um, I had a lady, a lady, pro tour uh, lady, a multi-time time trial champion, uh, who came to be fit um, several days after her second labial debulking surgery. So you talk about getting bad advice from your youthful coaches, sit on this lady, you know. So she got so much scar that she had to be debulked on several occasions. So we put her on a lithia, it's not a race saddle. And, and she's to, today, two years later, still riding a lithia in the, in the, on the world tour women's circuit. So whatever works, right? And so there's this huge overlap in, in genders that, uh, that this is why there's no more pink flowers on, on women's bikes. You know I, mean? I mean, it's too bad that, I mean, I always thought it was too bad that we had to make specific women's and men's products. Yeah. But the marketing people uh, in the industry and at Specialized felt that it was very, very important to do that, to give women something specifically for them. But logically, it would be so much better if we treated saddles like we treat BG Fit and we measure people individually, no matter what gender they are, and, uh, and fit them for the proper equipment. Uh, so many people won't ride a saddle because they think it's a woman's saddle, when it really is maybe a better choice for them. When, Let me tell them. In 2005, I was in, with Frank Sommer in, in Germany. We measured blood flow on the first women's saddles, and it was better. And he said, hey, wait a minute, give me that one. I want that saddle. I don't want the other one. Um, so we've, oh, we've always struggled. Uh, with that. It's a, it's a problem that I hope we've, we've done well with now the, the new wider saddles and the, and the specific cutouts. I think that we've, we've answered the question finally now. I, I, I just had a recent really fun experience. I saw Shaquille O'Neal's, so I'm not going to break any confidence because I'm not going to tell you his name, but Shaquille O'Neal's practice dummy who followed, wherever Shaquille went in his NBA career, this guy went. They were 
tied it to him. And he, he was the guy who practiced. So he comes in like this, you know, for 20 years of guarding Shaquille. But so other than having to make, tweak the front end of the bike, he was 6'11 and a half, 300 pounds. And the 168 Aura, 168 Women's Saddle, is the one that felt the best of this guy. And so I'm telling him the story, how, how the saddle came about. He goes, trust me, dude, when I sit on the saddle, ain't nobody seeing it. <laughs> this massive, you know, body covered up that saddle. You know. Uh, I have the impression that I think I've got some pretty snafu'd uh, foot and lower leg geometry. Yep. Uh, in particular, my, my feet are very pronated. And on top of that, over the last 10 years or so, maybe, my feet of my foot position has gotten more asymmetric, where I'm more relatively toed in on the right foot than I am on the left foot. So my left foot wants to rub my chain stay where my <coughs> right foot's further out. Now, despite this, and I, it looks strange enough that it's common for people to comment on it, but despite that, I feel very comfortable in my uh, ancient city genius shoes in which uh, a long time ago uh, <coughs> someone took my, uh, uh, I'm drawing a blank, Birkenstocks. They yep. took a pair of Birkenstocks and the dog had eaten the upper, uppers off of them and what they did is they made a foot pad for me out of my trashed Birkenstock foot pads and it's been very comfortable. I guess my question is, I'm really sort of skeptical that although your product does all these things, that it could deal with an asymmetry that I have where my feet are not, uh, not yeah. symmetric over that center plane. Well, a couple things. I don't know without looking at you. And we're not set up for that tonight, so I couldn't tell you whether you're a candidate or not without the pre-fit assessment. We've got to make the bike look like you. So without knowing what you really look like, I don't, I don't know the answer to the question. Number two, Birkenstock, the fact that they took a Birkenstock and put it in your CD just tells me something about your CD, doesn't it? It needed a lot of what Birkenstock offers, arch support, metatarsal support. So you customize your CD geniuses by giving them a lot of the attributes that we're talking about. So yeah, absolutely. Arch collapse. Arch collapse is a, is a bad thing when it comes to cycling. And, and so the forefoot varus is easy to demonstrate to you what happens. Think about arch collapse. The tibia sits on top of the ankle bone. And as the arch collapses, the ankle bone rotates. What does the tibia do? The tibia rotates. So the glutes, the, the, the uh, iliotibial band, the adductors are all struggling to hold your knee in place if you don't hold your arch in place. If you let your arch collapse in cycling, this huge cascade of events occurs um, far greater than forefoot varus. So arch support is number one. The first thing I do to a pair of CD shoes when they come in, put arches in them. Yeah, I have a question. So, uh, first of all, I just switched to your shoes and they, uh, they, they feel great and they feel powerful. So, they just feel great. I, I haven't been tested <laughs> for speed or power, but uh, in any event, that, that, that was a great change. Uh, can you comment on uh, the handlebar drop, please? Sure. Uh, a little bit about, because I'm, I'm 55 and I'm still riding the bike with a lot of drop and it feels great. But you know, everything you read, everything you he says, hey, it, once you get older, you're supposed to be raising those handlebars. Would you mind comment on that? Absolutely. So the, the Italians were the first ones to actually write down anything about fit. The Belgians and all the other Euros had to let it be you know, a, lot of, a lot of art to it. And if you were a famous fast rider, then everybody wanted to look like you. But the Italians were the first one to write it down. And one of the interesting things that the Italians said in their Fit Bible, um, you should see me try to give this lecture in Italy, man. It, it, you talk about, no, I'm gonna have my narrow, anyway. um, It says that no handlebar shall be greater than the rider's fist width, lower than the top of the saddle. Which, it, which is saying, you gotta look at the rider. 
Right? I mean, you've got to look at the rider. And that's their maximum drop was four or five centimeters, unless you're a great big guy. But most of the little Italian riders had small hands. So their drops were not very big. But what the Italians were at least saying was, look at the rider. What, what does he, uh, what, what kind of phenotype is he? They didn't take into account hamstring flexibility. Didn't take into account core strength. Didn't take into, back, uh, into effect lumbar um, flexibility, low back flexibility. So I, I can, it, it, if you're comfortable, I suspect you're okay. If you've got extremely long arms. There are, I, I saw a guy uh, in, on the Astana team recently. And we heard that he was coming with a 17 centimeter stem. We heard that he was coming. With the seven, what are you going to do with that? They were all, you know, snickering in the back, and everybody, you know, we can't wait to fit on this guy. It looked perfect for him. This guy has monkey arms. I mean, truly, he could scratch his ankles. It was the, <laughs> and for him, the the bike size was right. He was on a '56 bike with a 17 centimeter stem. So, what do you look like? I don't know. So that the key is the bike needs to look like you. It's all about flexibility. Your case, arm length, core strength, all those things. Great question, though. Drop is a, is a, one of those big mysteries, no doubt. One more. Uh, okay. Andy, you checked me out at uh, the Davis Finney camp in Fit for, in 1995. You had black hair, and I had hair. <laughs> <laughs> and, and they had you look at me because my left leg stuck out pretty, like, four inches from the top tube. Uh, yep. because I broke the small bone in the lower part of my leg and it healed bad. And, uh, and 18 years later, I'm riding with my knee close to the top tube, but I just broke a saddle when I took it into Bicycle Sports Shop. They saw that uh, my sit bone dents were uh, crooked. Uh, and my question is, should I try to go back to my old way wow. and... And, what uh, year was this I saw you? Huh? <laughs> you um, I don't know the answer to your question. You need to come see the, I mean, uh, what did I do to you in 1999? Well, you, you just told, you told Davis and Connie to quit sm smacking my knee that that's the way it is. I like that. And... <laughs> and uh, you, well, Laura, you remember Laura May Pikey sitting right here in the front row? She was a oh, camp yeah. counselor yeah, she, at that camp you're talking yeah. about. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I, without seeing you, I don't know. But asymmetrical sit bones, um, well, from 1999 to today, I guarantee you my uh, knowledge quantum leap was way bigger from 99 to 2013 than it was from 1975 to 1999. The, the, the information gathering and the number of people I've seen. So if I was to see you today, I probably would work really hard at getting you square on your saddle. I probably would have an asymmetrical stance width to allow for that one, that one knee that wants to kick out. So if you think about, we call it windswept. If the wind's blowing from over there, you know the trees on the north side of the mountain always do this. Well, windswept means that you got one knee in valgus, one knee in varus, and one knock knee, one bow leg. And that usually means you're turned on the saddle. I can sit here and give you 10 different scenarios that make, make you do that. Saddle's too narrow for you. We, none of us want to sit on the middle. I love to tell, love to tell guys this. Half the male penis is inside. You wouldn't think about sitting on the part that's on the outside. So why would you sit on the part that's on the inside? So what we tend to do is we tend to scoot to one side to get one sit bone up on that solid saddle and ride down the road like a crab, like a, wind, a plane coming in, plane coming in in a crosswind. So that's, you know, could that be you? Yes. Your broken leg could have created a, a windswept or a varus knee pulling you around that one side. I would treat you significantly different today than I did in 1999. Absolutely. So I would suggest you let the guys take a look. Thank you. you bet. Well, the, the, the 20 step prefit assessment, one of those assessments is cervical range of motion and, and limitations. So, we would, what's your history? If you had an MRI of your neck, do you have numbness and tingling? Blah, 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 blah. And, and, and measure your cervical range of motion. Neutral fit means that you should not be at the end range of your, of your cervical range. So, if you've got 
some kind of posture anomaly that you're, you know, your cervical range is there, and you're trying to ride this really low drop and do that, all you're going to do is jam your facets and discs together. So I suspect the problem is in the front end of your bike. Can, can a saddle create neck pain? Can a saddle create neck pain? Absolutely. If I'm on the wrong saddle, and I have to clinch my, sorry, Roger. I have to, <laughs> Thanks, I have Andy. to clinch my pelvic floor muscles to give me something to sit on, I'm going to do this. Right? So if I've done this to give my butt something to sit on, and I have to reach the front of the bike, what have I done to my neck? It's like a big fishing pole, and I've got a big fish on the end of the pole. Right? If I can get myself on the right saddle, everything, so saddles can cause neck pain. You've got to be careful, though, because um, there are bike-related uh, pain issues, and there's medical yep. problems. And in that case, uh, you've got to make sure that you don't have a herniated disc or more in your neck or something even, even different. So the first year when we made saddles, I think five people contacted me that they had pain on their, when riding the first BG saddle, and five of those guys had prostate cancer. Uh, for me, I mean, I had four herniated discs in my neck and I needed a fusion. So um, don't assume right away that it's just gonna be a bike-related issue. It might be something more. So yep. try the bike, bike stuff. If that doesn't work, then get it checked. Uh, same thing with chest pain or shortness of breath or anything like that. Don't deny symptoms. Uh, we, we both know yeah. people that have died because they, they denied the obvious. And so if, you, if you're riding and you get any kind of symptom riding up a hill that goes away when you're riding down the hill, get your heart checked. I tell, we tell the guys in class, you can't fix everything with a five millimeter key. <laughs> so if you've got pain off the bike that the bike exacerbates, it ain't the bike's fault, right? So you've got to be mad and point your anger at the right, per at the right, at the right place. I one more. <clears throat> That's amazing. When Google is so accurate. Roger. I mean, uh, with the saddles, what, we, what the plan is is to, is to get more and more relief, more comfortable, even in deep arrow positions, uh, to more exactly fit the rider's needs, no matter what kind of riding they're doing. Uh, you know, it, sometimes it's hard because it, it's a saddle. I mean, it, you sit on it, it doesn't seem like it can, can go in very many directions. But, this year, like with the Cetero saddle, we broke into a new area, and that may open some doors. When we find out how people relate to it, not only the triathletes and the time trailers, but the rest of the bicycling community, then it may lead us, and probably will lead us, into new ideas about design. So the idea is to keep your mind open. Don't get locked into tradition. That's been a problem in the bicycling industry forever. And now we're, we're, we're fighting that with science, but uh, still in some parts of the world, I mean, uh, it's very tough for people to open their minds. So, I, I mean, I think we have to keep open-minded and keep studying different things and trying new things with prototypes. Yeah, I, I, I would totally agree that we don't know where it's going. I mean, and we learn, um, I learn in my office seeing medically-based cycling issues. Um, we now have this army of fitters around the world for data collection points. It's pretty amazing. So, for example, we did a study at the center uh, measuring ischial tuberosities, uh, the, the sit bone widths using a pressure mapping device back in the old days. And the only, the only pepper ma pressure mapping device we had in those days were inch measuring. Yeah. So, they were, so all, of our, all of our saddle tests looked like a footprint uh, with, with two high point you know, measuring. And so we had a very small data point, um, data collection. And then we did one that was maybe 70 or 80 samples and kept showing us the same things. We found in the literature one that had a couple of hundred issue tuberosity measurements in it. We said, Whoa, let's contact all the body geometry fitters around the world, have them send us all their assometer measurements. <laughs> Duh. And now we've got this huge data pool, and the 168 saddle was born out of that. So 
man, we just got to keep our ear to the ground. You know? I, I, think, I think the, the point of the lecture for, for me and for Andy is, is to really kind of give you an idea of, of the depth that, that we go and Specialized has gone to look at the real science and, and not, not the marketing of, of products, but look at the, the background and, and how to really develop something that, that will change the industry. And so the products and the BG Fit that we've done in the last 15 years has changed the world. And we've got millions of people now riding these kind of products and being comfortable. I was saying to some people here that in 1997, the idea of making a rider comfortable didn't exist in the bicycle industry. It was just everybody was blaming the rider for not being comfortable and saying you gotta work out and get in shape. Uh, when the first BG saddle came out and uh, changed the saddle industry around the world, everybody said, wow, there might be money in making people comfortable. And so body geometry then started a trend that's been very, very valuable for everybody. Thank you, guys.